Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's seminar. This is the first in a seminar series that we're holding um, throughout the big gap between uh, IROS and ICRA um, for the TC on model-based optimization for robotics. Um, we, if you don't know who we are, we're basically a group of people who are trying to help organize events and promote model-based optimization algorithms within the whole IEEE uh, space. And we're sort of uh, growing and starting to have more events and do more things. So if you want to get uh, involved, uh, please reach out. We're always looking for help uh, to grow our community and help keep us all connected. And if you, um, yeah, and if you have really cool ideas, uh, you can either just tell us that more or help uh, implement them. Um, and so today for our, our first uh, seminar, we have uh, Zach Manchester from CMU. So Zach is an assistant professor of robotics at CMU. He holds a PhD in aerospace engineering and a BS in applied physics from Cornell. Um, Zach was a postdoc in the Agile Robotics Lab at Harvard when I was a PhD student <laughs> and uh, was previously worked at Stanford, NASA Ames Research Center and, and Local Graphics Inc. He received an NSF Early Career Faculty Award in 2018 and has led three satellite missions. His research and interests include motion planning control and numerical optimization. But beyond that, Zach is awesome and probably the only reason why I passed my first real hard robotics course when he was the TA way back when. Uh, so I'm very excited and grateful to have him here talking about composable optimization for robotic motion planning and control. So I have, the floor is yours, Zach. All right. Thank you, Brian. Thank you guys for having me. Um, I, I'm generally a big fan of, of you know the group, and I hope to, you know, I'm glad to see you guys doing this. This is great. Um, so thanks again. And um, I'd like to just throw it out there. I know we have a decent sized crowd, but I, I generally am, a, you know, really big fan of having audience interaction uh, as much as possible and rather than talk at you uh, for, you know, 45 minutes or whatever. So please, please ask questions. Uh, I do have the chat window open so I can see it. So you can feel free to type in there. But I don't know how you guys organizers feel, but I'm I'm all for people like raising their hands and interrupting and stuff. So uh, that'll make it more fun for everyone, I think. So well, well I'm definitely, you know, Cool doing Q&A at the end, but uh, please feel free to interrupt me. Uh, I I will. It'll make it more fun in general, I think. OK, cool. So let's do it. Um, I guess I'm going to start off with sort of a, a little bit of inspirational pitch. Um, I am a space guy, as as was alluded to, um, and my background's in aerospace, and I'm a, kind of a space nerd. So um, if I'm thinking about my favorite robots, uh, one of them has to be, you know, Mars Curiosity. Um, this is not the latest one. This is the last last rover. Um, this thing was uh, has been on Mars for ten years uh, in you know an incredibly harsh environment. It's a, it's a, an amazing feat of engineering that this thing you know is still operating. In that time, it's covered twenty eight kilometers, which sounds like a lot and is you know incredibly impressive considering you know how what it took to get there and everything. But if you kind of think about this from a say motion planning and control perspective, which is what I do, and you divide those two numbers. You come up with something like seven and a half meters per day is how much ground this thing covers, um, which is not a lot. And um, if you wonder why that's the case, it's because this thing is actually not very autonomous at all. Uh, in fact, if you visit JPL, you will see this thing called the Mars Yard outside. They have basically a big sandbox with a bunch of rocks in it. And the way they plan motions for this rover and decide where to drive uh, is they sort of take uh, the images from the cameras, they go into this Mars yard uh, at JPL, and they arrange all the boulders and rocks to look just like what's around the rover on Mars. And then they practice driving the rover around and try to figure out, you know, how to drive it um, in this Mars yard, in this like practice sandbox uh, by hand. So this is incredibly slow, painstaking, human in the loop work. Um, that I ultimately I would argue is is limiting this number, right? And um, and uh, ultimately limiting what the, the science we can achieve, right, in, in these sorts of missions. Um, so that's my case for more autonomy uh, on these kind of vehicles. And um, where I'm kind of interested in taking this stuff, which is sort of, you know, the out there crazy version of this, this is what inspires me as far as like the work we do on these kind of systems, right? Uh, these are mountain goats. They can do incredible things. If you compare this to the Mars rover system, right, these guys are going up sheer rock faces, reasoning about terrain in an incredibly you know, sophisticated manner. Um, they're super robust to, you know, slipping and nearly falling and recovering. Uh, they're fast, they're agile, right? All of the things we love our, our robotic systems to be. Okay, so that's what we want to do. 
Uh, and now I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the work that my lab is currently doing, has been working on over the last couple of years to try to make robots uh, able to do those sorts of things. And uh, we're going to kind of divide this into two parts. Part one is, uh, the title says it, uh, everything is optimization. So I'm going to try to convince you, we're in the right audience for this, right? It's model-based optimization. So I want to try to convince you that basically every piece of this problem um from at least from a you know kind of control perspective motion planning perspective uh is uh at least can be posed as an optimization problem and maybe that's a good idea maybe it's not i don't know we'll we'll see so everything is optimization let's let's dig into this so the first one should surprise no one in this uh, audience control you know as optimization this is a pretty standard looking trajectory optimization problem of the flavor that we solve all the time in my lab um, and that we write you know, fast solvers for and this kind of thing. So you've got a model of your robot expressed as you know, your F equals MA stuff and maybe you know, actuator limits as inequality constraints. And then you have this thing up here, which is uh, objective function or cost function that encodes really is, is trying to encode behavior. It's trying to encode what you want the system to do, right? In the form of say, get to some goal state, minimize energy, minimize fuel, minimize time. Something like that, right? So you write down like kind of what you wanted to do in the form of a scalar cost function, and then the physics basically in the form of these uh, you know model equations, and then try to get a computer to solve this for you with varying degrees of success, and then hopefully that that can run on the robot, right? Okay, so control can be posed as optimization. No surprise, long history of doing this, and that's why everyone's here. Um, the next one is maybe uh, familiar to you if you took sort of an advanced physics course uh, in undergrad or, or grad school, right? Um, but physics, and uh, in particular, what we care about in robotics, right? Mostly mechanics, uh, dynamics, right? Of, of rigid body systems and maybe deformable systems can be also posed as an optimization problem. Um, this is called the least action principle or uh, Hamilton's principle. And it says that the trajectory, uh, so this is a posed trajectory, Q of T, uh, hopefully you can see my mouse and that's somewhat useful, uh, that the system follows is the one that minimizes this cost function over here, which is called the action S. And the thing inside here is just the Lagrangian that we're familiar with from classical mechanics, right? Like kinetic minus potential energy. Okay. Oh, and I, I, I guess I labeled this, which is good of me, but that I forgot I did that. Okay. So, so that's that thing. Um, so usually what we do, um, you maybe saw this once in some mechanics class, right? And then you saw, you sat through some, you know, arcane exercise and calculus of variations and integration by parts that you probably don't remember uh, that took this thing and somehow, you know, ended up with the Euler-Lagrange equations and the manipulator equation out of this, right? And then you never touch this again and you just sort of use that Euler-Lagrange thing or the manipulator thing and there's some software package that hands that to you and that's nice. Um, I'm going to argue that maybe um, it's actually worth looking at this at this higher level optimization problem uh, from this perspective. Here's why. Uh, okay, so I can take this thing. If I actually stare at this for a second, it looks a whole lot like that optimal control problem that we just looked at, right? It's some scalar cost function, which here's the Lagrangian, integrated along some trajectory, and I minimize that thing, right? So it looks a whole lot like a trajectory optimization problem. And in fact, not so surprisingly, I can solve this like a trajectory optimization problem. So this is really different from how you are maybe used to doing dynamics, but hear me out, I guess. So we can take this problem, we can discretize it in time. So we, instead of Q of T, which are the poses, right? We get a bunch of Q sub Ks, discrete time, which is exactly how we'd numerically solve a, you know, a optimal control problem. We can just set this thing up and explicitly minimize it with an optimizer. Um, why might you wanna do this? Well, if we can do this, um, I should mention this is not, you know, uh, I did not invent this idea. This is called um, discrete mechanics. It's actually surprisingly recent, though. This stuff was invented in like the early 2000s by a guy named Jerry Marsden um, and a bunch of his students at Caltech. Uh, really interesting. Here's the part that's super fun for us. So I can directly minimize this and get physics rather than kind of going through all this tackle of variation stuff. Um, and when I do this, it's now a sort of nice numerical optimization problem that I know how to solve. Um, and one of the cool things that lets me do is add inequality constraints. So, which I'm used to doing, right, from trajectory optimization and everything else. And in particular, what I can do there is, okay, here's that least action thing, discrete time version of it. I now I'm going to add this inequality constraint where this phi thing here is a sine distance function that tells me um, the distance in this cartoony picture between this brick, say, and the floor. 
So phi is just the height of the brick. And what this says is I'm going to solve this problem subject to the constraint that phi has to be greater than or equal to zero, aka the brick's not allowed to fall through the floor, right? So I set this up and I basically just do standard textbook constrained optimization. I can actually solve this with any kind of standard, you know, solver I want. And what pops out of this is impacts. And unsurprisingly, you'll get like a Lagrange multiplier term for this constraint where um, the sort of Jacobian of the constraint ends up being the normal vector. The Lagrange multiplier ends up being the contact impulse, the normal force basically that keeps the brick from falling through the floor and all of it just works. And in particular, one of the reasons this is so powerful compared to say other contact models that people use like, you know, weird nonlinear spring damper models or, or you know, whatever smooth things Rujoko does or whatever. Um, this number one, um, always strictly respects the, the interpenetration constraints. So you don't get weird artifacts where things sink into the floor. Um, and it's numerically well-behaved. You don't end up with issues with stiffness and crazy small time steps. Like if you tried to use a spring damper model and, and things like that. So this is, I would argue in some sense, like the, the most natural way to do this and it's numerically well-behaved and, and works well and stuff like that. Um, okay. So that's impacts and like mechanic stuff. Um, the next one to mention is friction, which is also really annoying. Um, Coulomb friction, right? So um, you can imagine uh, things like stick slip behavior, where if I sort of have a thing on the surface and I push, 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 and then all of a sudden it breaks static friction and slides. That behavior is also non-smooth and non-differentiable and all kinds of badness and hard to simulate. Um, but it turns out that also can be posed as an optimization problem. Uh, with inequality constraints. This thing's called the maximum dissipation principle. Um, and it says that the Coulomb friction force that um, that you get is, uh, which we call B here, is the one that minimizes the instantaneous rate of change of kinetic energy. So what this is saying is basically friction is going to suck out the most kinetic energy instantaneously uh, that it can subject to this constraint, which is called the friction cone, which is basically a generalization of the like high school physics thing where, you know, friction is mu some friction coefficient times the normal force. This says norm of the friction vector is less than or equal to that mu times the normal force where lambda here's the normal force. So that says basically that the friction has to lie inside some cone where the the Z height here is the normal force. And then the, um, the tangential direction is, is the friction. So what this is really saying is um, if I, um, if I have enough friction force available, if mu is high enough and lambda is high enough, I can basically keep the object stationary. So I can suck out all the kinetic energy and keep kinetic energy at zero, right? So that's sticking. And then what this says is you can imagine if I keep pushing my object here harder and harder and harder, well, friction is going to respond by sucking out as much kinetic energy as it can. It's going to try to keep the object stationary. So as long as you're inside the cone and you have, you know, friction to spare, you'll, you'll stay still up until if I keep pushing, 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 I'll run up to the edge of the cone and I don't have any more friction to give. And then I'll start slipping. So slipping is when the friction vector hits the side of the cone and can't suck out any more energy. So this naturally captures stick slip behavior. Uh, again, no artifacts, no weird stiffness problems. It just works. Um, that's kind of neat. And this one's actually a convex optimization problem, second order cone program, which we have nice solvers for and all that good stuff. Okay, so hopefully we've got uh, we got control, we've got you know dynamics with impacts and friction. Um, the last one, which we've actually been working on a bunch recently in my lab, um, is collision detection, uh, which turns out to be you know, super important uh, if you want to simulate you know manipulation, uh, all kinds of you know. Uh, if you have complex geometry on your robot or the environment, this ends up being a key sort of kernel in, in doing simulation and, and control stuff under the hood. The kind of standard state-of-the-art algorithms that people use to do this uh, are, uh, one of the, the big ones is called GJK or Enhanced GJK. This is more or less standard in a lot of the video game engines and robotics simulators. Um, and the way that works, it assumes convex polytopes and it more or less kind of like, um, does a bunch of pivoting and kind of goes along the, the vertices of the shapes and tries to figure out if they're um, in, in contact or not that way. But it's, it's a very like um, discrete uh, search flavored algorithm. Um, and the issue, the reason we don't like that is that it's not differentiable. It's not smooth. And um, it has a lot of edge cases. You can imagine if you have like two objects, um, you end up with pretty discrete different cases where if you have say face-to-face 
versus uh, where you get like a patch contact versus point to point versus like edge to face. We will get a line contact. There's all these weird cases that show up um, and these cause problems for these algorithms. And in general, um, when you're what these algorithms tend to try to do is spit out the closest points between objects and, and sort of the contact point as a point. You can imagine if I have like two boxes, if they're face to face, you really have a contact patch. That point is not well defined and weird things happen. For example, for some epsilon perturbation, really tiny, say, tilting of the box, that contact point can slam from this corner to this corner, basically discontinuously. So this causes all kinds of annoying issues for these simulators as well. So that's how we do it now. Uh, what are we doing here? Um, so we've come up with a, a formulation of this in my lab um, where between convex primitives, so convex shapes, which here's a, a handful of them right here that you can think about. So spheres, you know, polytopes, pills or capsules, cylinders, cones, all these convex shapes. Um, we can pose this collision detection and closest point problem as a convex optimization problem, which is maybe not super surprising if you think about, oh, yeah, point and do convex sets and then like closest points, you know, some minimum norm thing, all these are convex functions. So you can do that. It turns out getting this to work in all cases, um, including these weird edge cases and including both uh, when things are interpenetrating and not, um, there's a bunch of weird corner cases. So you actually have to formulate this in a pretty careful way to, um, to make it work in general. Um, and we've come up with a nice formulation of this that that always works essentially. And we have nice proofs of you know boundedness and it's always guaranteed to return a solution and all this kind of stuff. So there's a we've come up with a pretty clean way to do it. And the upshot here is um it's always differentiable. Um it doesn't suffer from any of these weird, you know, discontinuous edge casey things and, and it kind of works super nicely. Okay, so hopefully I've convinced you now that almost all the sub problems involved in, in sort of contact rich, you know, robotic motion plan and control, at least can be, and maybe, maybe it's advantageous in some of these cases posed as optimization problems. And in a lot of these cases, it's, it's things that we don't typically think about as optimization problems, like physics, collision detection, right? This kind of stuff. So the next thing that I'm going to talk about is, um, okay, so we now have this, this idea that we can pose all these little pieces as optimization problems. Now to go and solve these kind of um, control problems, I um, I want to be able to glue these problems together. And this is a weird thing to do. Uh, what I'm talking about doing here is taking a whole bunch of individual optimization problems, all subject to inequality constraints and stuff like that. And I'm not talking about taking those and like smushing them into one optimization problem. It turns out in, in these cases, you can't quite do that. It doesn't really work. They're, they're separate problems, each with their own separate solution, but they're coupled, right? So um, the uh, pieces of, you know, the solution to this one problem might show up as a, as a variable in another problem, right? This kind of thing happens. So they're all coupled. And what I really want to do is glue them all together, couple them tightly, and jointly solve them together. And so I'm going to sort of like dig into that idea a little bit. That's the big idea. And that's what I'm calling composable optimization here. So maybe first off, just like digging into why we might want to do that again, um, just a little bit deeper. I, I showed you kind of all these things that are optimization, but um, to highlight some of the challenges here, if I want to go solve that trajectory optimization problem here again for something like this legged robot, um, it turns out this is really, really hard. And I'm sure many of you have tried doing this. The biggest issue is if I want to go and you know, use standard optimization tools that are based on taking gradients and, and or Newton's method, all these functions have to be um, at least continuously differentiable. And in the case of contact dynamics, where I've got impacts and friction, these things are non-smooth and I can't differentiate these things, at least not in the traditional sense that plays nice with optimization solvers. This causes a ton of problems. And so as I sort of, if I back up a little bit and, and explain that in some more detail, there's, there's sort of a couple approaches that people take now to doing this. Um, the most popular one and the one that's been most successful, frankly, is, is the so-called hybrid approach, where essentially what you do is pre-specify um, the contact sequence. So you kind of like pre-specify when impacts are going to happen, for instance, um, and, and more or less sort of abstract out or remove those impact physics from the problem. So if you can say when they're going to happen, you can, you can sort of like ignore them or, or bake them in and not have to diff through them. And then uh, basically just optimize over the smooth arcs between these impact events. Uh, pro is we're now back to 
a nice smooth optimization problem that we know how to solve and we have good tools for. Um, the, the disadvantage of this is that we um, really have to pre-specify, you know, to some extent, the ordering at least, and kind of when these are going to happen relative to each other. Um, you can do this for legged robots in particular really well, right? You can imagine if I have a gate sequence, like for a biped, it's left, right, left, right. That's super easy. For a quadruped, I might have a few options, right? Like I can walk, trot, canter, this kind of thing, right? Um, where I might have to specify a gate, but you can do that reasonably for something with like, you know, four points of contact with, on the feet. If you start talking about uh, complex manipulation tasks, for instance, where I have a hand with, you know, a bunch of fingers and not only that, but like not just discrete points of contact, but surfaces that can contact kind of anywhere in any combination. Um, this idea of pre-specifying uh, the, the contact configurations and, and modes over time starts to look daunting and kind of terrible. And in fact, there's this uh, so-called combinatorial explosion of modes, right? Where this, this starts to be pretty, pretty gross to think about doing for really complicated uh, particularly manipulation tasks, right? Okay, so that's that's maybe the the classic approach. Um, the uh, the an alternative to this is so called contact implicit um, optimization, where what we'd really like to do is put all the physics in there, including all the contact forces, um, and then and then just go and have the solver do it all for us. Um, in the the sort of dream here, and and there's been hints of this, you know, over the last few years is that you could generate really complex motions, gates, contact sequences, everything just comes out of the solver. Um, the problem here is that the, the traditional ways of doing this are um, uh, basically like a hopelessly fraught with numerical problems, all of which come from really at the root, the idea that these, these like impacts and friction things, if you try to model them using smooth approximations of the physics and things like this, you end up with extremely stiff ODEs that are you know, really hard to solve. Um, there's all kinds of relaxation tricks people try, but at the end of the day, these are just kind of fundamentally discontinuous problems that are they're not easily differentiable. And um, there's huge, huge numerical problems associated with any kind of gradient-based optimization on top of these things. So they have uh, uh, just horrible numerical difficulties. So um, this whole approach that I'm talking about, this composable optimization idea is, is sort of a way of sidestepping those numerical issues. Okay, so here's the picture. Um, again, the idea here is I, I wanna take, for each of these problems, right? We talked about the, um, the impact dynamics problem, having this nice inequality constrained optimization thing that was very clean and worked really well. Coulomb friction, right? It's got its own little second order cone formulation that works really well. Uh, collision stuff I can pose as convex optimization, we just said. And then the control problem, you know, we kind of, those are maybe nasty non-convex things, but we do it all the time, right, for smooth systems. So for each of these, I can imagine writing down a nice solver that's really tailored to the problem and has, you know, robust convergence and whatever exploits the convexity of these things in certain cases and does really well. So what I really want to do is uh, here is not try to smush all that into one solver, but instead, like philosophically, what I want to do is look at each one of these. Uh, design a really good solver for that particular problem and then wire them together. When I say wire them together, here's what I'm talking about. So what we're going to do now is zoom into one of these blocks. So think about one of these blocks as a, its own little solver uh, that's solving this problem. So this is like a generic form of, of one of these problems where I've got some objective function F and some constraint C. Uh, and we'll just talk about the inequalities here because that's the hard part. Uh, and so for this given problem, X are the so-called decision variables. So these are the things you're minimizing with respect to. And then theta are what we're going to call the problem parameters. So these are variables that show up in the problem. So they might show up in the dynamics constraints or in the cost function, but they're not the variables that I'm optimizing with respect to in this given problem. So the way to think about this, to be concrete about it, is if I go back to, to this guy, in the impact dynamics problem, this has got my like F equals MA stuff and my collision you know, impact stuff. Uh, well, if it's got the F equals MA dynamics, the friction shows up in there in the F equals MA dynamics, but it's not what I'm optimizing with respect to in this problem. Likewise, this guy is in, uh, optimizing my F equals MA stuff and my contact, my uh, normal force, my collision stuff. Um, the normal force shows up in the Coulomb friction problem as a parameter, but it's not what I'm optimizing with respect to, right? I'm optimizing with respect to that friction vector, but the, the normal force is an input to this problem. It's a problem parameter, right? So hopefully that makes sense. So there's variables that like I'm optimizing over here, but show up in this problem and vice versa. 
So that's the distinction between uh, decision variable and problem parameter or, or uh, whatever. Okay, so that's the idea. And ultimately what I wanna be able to do here is uh, take a solution to this and differentiate the solution with respect to these problem parameters. Uh, so how do we do that? And I, we talked about you know, all this non-smooth badness. So um, the, the, the magic secret sauce trick is what we're gonna call a differentiable interior point method. So to back up a little bit here, um, there's lots of ways of solving inequality constrained optimization problems like this. There's tons of methods, right? There's sort of, you know, sequential quadratic programming, there's augmented Lagrangian methods, ADMM, interior point methods, all have different pros and cons. Um, we're going to focus here on interior point methods. Um, and the, the sort of gist of what interior point methods do is they take these inequality constraints and they handle them by pushing them into the objective with what's called a log barrier. So this extra term. So I'm gonna take this C greater than or equal zero thing and I'm gonna stuff it inside a log and have this little kind of fudge factor tuning parameter row here, which is called the central path parameter or barrier parameter. Uh, the reason this works is that if you think about this, uh, if you think about what, what minus log looks like, it blows up to infinity as C approaches zero. And here's like a picture of that. Right, so as C, uh, as C of X gets closer and closer to zero, this thing blows up to infinity. And at, at the actual constraint, the hard constraint where it's equal to zero, this thing blows up to infinity. So the idea is it's called a barrier function because if you put this in the cost function, it sort of forms this infinite cost barrier that you shouldn't cross, right? If you, if you do things right in the algorithm. Um, and then this row uh, sort of shows up like a smoothing parameter where um, as you crank on row, you can make this thing be sort of a soft, you know, smooth uh, barrier. Or as you crank down on it, it approaches sort of this brick wall indicator function thing as you crank, 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 right? Okay, so um, you could think of this really in some way as like some smooth relaxation of the inequality constraint. In much the same way, people like smooth impacts and friction in, in these dynamic simulators, right? The difference here is that um, this interior point stuff is backed by 30 plus years of theory and, and algorithms from the optimization world and has provable guarantees for like, you know, quadratic convergence on convex problems and all this kind of stuff. So um, uh, what this is designed to do, though, ultimately is I, I basically do this trick. I smooth this thing out, put it in the objective. Then I can use Newton's method on it because this log, um, while it blows up here, it's actually, you know, continuously differentiable and Newton's method plays nice with it. So I can stuff it in there. I can do this barrier trick and I can do Newton's method and, and all my nice second order optimization with it. And um, I, I, there are good ways, i.e. theoretically, you know, motivated, like really provable ways with guarantees to crank on this row such that I can guarantee that this thing is going to converge to the true answer machine precision all that kind of good stuff. So there's lots of nice optimization theory out there for this thing. Um, okay, so I can solve this problem with this interior point thing, but um, the next piece is the differentiable piece. So by doing this, I've kind of smoothed this thing out, right? And I can converge to the you know hard answer, but I can also back off and smooth it a little bit. And if I back off and smooth it a little bit and take advantage of the fact that Newton's method works on this and I can take derivatives, I can differentiate this thing. Uh, and in fact, the derivatives I'm, I'm writing down here um, are the same ones I have to compute inside a Newton solver to solve the optimization problem to begin with. So getting the derivatives is not actually very expensive, or you're doing it already effectively if you're solving the optimization problem. So this is called the implicit function theorem. This has become kind of a, a big deal in like the machine learning community. People are into this now. But essentially, um, uh, if I take this problem and I write down its its sort of gradient equals zero first order optimality conditions, the KKT conditions uh, of the interior point problem. I can then uh, sort of differentiate it, massage it around and take uh, this Jacobian of X with respect to theta. Uh, this is the math for that, it's pretty easy. R here is the, the KKT residual. These are the like gradient equals zero conditions, right? So I have like R equals zero and I can take its derivative with respect to X and theta and kind of massage around and get this. Um, the upshot here is now this inequality constrained optimization problem, I can evaluate the solution X as a function of theta that's solving the problem. And I can get this first derivative like this out of solution. Now I can treat this optimization problem just like any other function. I can treat it like any other differentiable function X of theta that I can evaluate X of theta and, and DXD theta. 
I can now use this inside other optimization solvers, right? Um, just like any other function, like a constraint function or an objective function, I can get the gradients, all that good stuff. So this is how we're kind of going at this composable optimization thing. We're using these interior point methods. We're taking advantage of their, their differentiability properties. Um, we're solving them to whatever tolerance we want. And then we're differentiating the solution um, by taking advantage of the, the things we've already computed inside the solver. So you can actually do this pretty efficiently. Okay, so what are we doing with this? What have we done with this so far? Um, we built a simulator, which is maybe ill-advised. When we started this, uh, Mujoko had not yet been open source, and we were kind of like, oh, we're going to make a better simulator and beat Mujoko on all these physics benchmarks, and we're going to be open source and free. And then, you know, you know what happened there. So that kind of stole our thunder a bit. Uh, but I'd say on the technical sort of physics side, we're still um, doing some interesting things. So uh, what we did here is, if you imagine that, that uh, plot, right? We took the impact dynamic stuff, the Coulomb friction stuff, and the collision detection stuff and bolted it together. And um, this is, you know, dropping Atlas and whatever. Um, and this is, I don't know, lots of degrees of freedom in real time. So it does reasonably well. It's not the fastest simulator. It's not performance wise, it's not as fast as Mujoko because this was written by two PhD students in like, you know, six months. So uh, give us some time. But Here's kind of the upshot of, of this. If you do it this way, and we kind of talked about all this optimization stuff and least action stuff, I can do hard contact simulation. Um, what that really means is I'm cranking down on those barrier parameters and the interior point problem all the way to like machine precision. So I get the real answer. I don't get any interpenetration because I'm satisfying those inequality constraints on the sine distance function uh, to machine precision. So it's no interpenetration. I'm also solving that second order cone friction problem, you know, to machine precision. So I don't get any creep or weird sliding stuff. Um, it turns out, uh, I didn't mention this before, but this sort of minimize the least action directly thing, that actually has a bunch of cool properties. One of which is that it sort of automatically conserves energy and momentum uh, for conservative systems. And it has really good long-term stability properties. So you don't have this kind of crazy thing where you have to take super tiny time steps to not blow up and add artificial damping to the simulator and stuff like this. So you get just generally way better physics out of this. Um, and finally, the, the big one is that we can, we can give you smooth gradients here. So I can give you like the A and B matrices of this thing um, anytime you want, basically for free. And, um, and they actually work. And I'll show you some examples of this. And the, the trick there is, I mentioned, right, in that interior point problem, I can crank that row down such that it's sort of the brick wall, non-smooth solution. So I do that. But what I can do then is if you want a nice smooth gradient that's useful for doing control stuff or optimization stuff, um, what we actually do is back off on the row. So we evaluate the hard solution. So the physics is the hard solution. But then to give you the gradient, what we'll do is basically rewind the solver a step to where row is a little bit more relaxed. So we have a nice smooth gradient. So it's hard physics with so that uh, with, with smooth gradients. Uh, and, and we can control that smoothing with that row by just backing up a couple of steps or whatever you want and, and give it to you for any value. Here's, here's a plot of that. So this is showing an impact. And this is as I vary that row, I can get um, what, the, what the gradients look like basically. So this is kind of the all the way cranked hard answer. And then for different values of row, you get smoother and smoother gradients. In practice, we uh, we found that like we basically, uh, for the purposes of evaluating Jacobians, we set row to like 1e minus 3. If we solve it, you know, to tight tolerances, we might crank it to 1e minus 8 or 9. Um, and we found that for doing interesting control things, 1e minus 3 gives you pretty good gradients. And if you think about that physically, um, that's still pretty small, right? You're talking about if your units are meters, you're getting sort of, you know, artifacts at the level of millimeters. So it's still pretty good. And, I, and also, again, we're evaluating the physics all the way hard. We're only doing this on the gradients. So you're still getting real answers. So this is impacts showing you what the row does. This is friction where you got stick slip behavior showing you basically the row, if you crank it, converges to the hard answer, but you can back off as much or as little as you want. Um, and again, we didn't, uh, here's, here's stuff that we've done with this. Um, so this one is running IOQR uh, with those A and B matrices on a hopper and just standard IOQR works fine. You get this kind of stuff. Um, this one's kind of fun. This one is we we throw a brick, uh, you know, with friction and everything on the ground and let it slide. And we do system identification on it. So we're estimating out the friction coefficient, actually the geometry of the box, like the size of it and the lengths of the sides and all this kind of stuff and, and some of the mass properties just by giving uh, measurements of, of, of this behavior, right? Um, effectively, like 
you know, pose measurements like mocap measurements. So we go and estimate out all the physics parameters, um, again, using standard nonlinear least squares and just dipping through the, the physics um, like I showed you. And this last one is just a couple of the open AI gym uh, examples um, with, you know, um, like little MLP control policies trained with standard gradient descent, though. So this is just like we use the simulator's gradients and just, you know, do gradient descent on it rather than running like these fancy black box RL algorithms. Um, so there's, I guess, one more to say about that. Uh, gradients are good, I guess, is the, the punchline there. So, yeah, so you can do cool things with this. And again, we didn't try hard on any of this. This is, um, we just kind of set that row to like 1e minus 3 to evaluate the gradients. Um, but the simulation runs are actually all hard physics. Uh, okay, cool. So that's uh, Dojo, things you can do with these gradients as the kind of cartoony examples. Um, and then here's kind of like that whole thing put all the way together where we take all that physics. And then on top of it, we're also now doing the optimal control stuff. So we're um, trying, so what we're trying to do here is all of this in real time to do model predictive control. We want to get to a point where we can actually do this contact implicit stuff for the robots reasoning about um, contact forces and so where to put its feet and, uh, uh, you know, push recovery where I have to like, I, I'm no longer running my nominal data. I have to do something else right now, right? That kind of thing. So we want to be able to reason about all that online in the controller. So that's what's going on here. Um, and uh, I'm going to now show a really horrible slide. I apologize. I should really change this. It's going to be terrifying. Uh, so, so sorry. Uh, don't, don't pay any attention to this. This is real bad. Uh, um, so this is all the math that is underneath this whole thing. Don't, the, the, the important part is, um, we can linearize a bunch of this to do MPC. That's what I want to get at. So this is all the robot dynamics. Um, what I'm going to do is, um, this is just, you know, your manipulator dynamics. And if you, you can see, you know, mass matrix, Coriolis things, whatever in there. So what I do here though, is I look at this. I have, if I, uh, if I'm trying to do MPC and track a reference trajectory, Normally, what I do is linearize about the reference trajectory, right? So I, I want to mention every time I say this stuff, someone's like, oh, you can't linearize contact. It's non-differentiable, blah, blah, blah. We're not linearizing the contact. What we're going to do is zoom in on this problem with all these blocks. And I'm going to go inside each block and strategically linearize or tailor expand pieces inside each of these blocks. I'm still keeping the overall block structure with all this inequality constrained optimization stuff, right? But really what I'm doing is I'm say taking this optimal control problem and instead of being a nonlinear, you know, optimal control problem, it's now a QP say, I'm taking this impact problem and rather than being some nonlinear, you know, non-convex problem, I'm turning it into effectively a QP. Um, this one I'm probably gonna keep as an SOCP but I could turn it into an LP if I wanted to. This one I'm gonna linearize a bunch of stuff and turn it into like a conic problem, right? That kind of stuff. This one's already nice actually. But I'm basically making strategic approximations inside the blocks while holding on to all the structure of the blocks still and all the inequality constraint stuff that actually reasons about the impacts. So that's kind of the idea. So I'm just trying to make each block easier to solve and faster to solve ultimately is why I'm doing this. So I'm going to linearize the dynamics about a reference trajectory that's inside that impact dynamics block. Um, this got kind of weird. And then I'm also going to linearize the contact uh, manifold. So this is the sign distance function. Um, so this is sort of in that collision detection block. So I'm linearizing a bunch of the pieces while keeping the overall structure. That's kind of the important thing. So I keep all of the collision -y inequality constraint stuff and interior point stuff in there. Okay. Uh, the other piece of the puzzle that's worth mentioning is... Um, a lot when we do this offline linearization about a reference trajectory, um, where uh, a bunch of the matrices that show up in this giant optimization framework, um, they become like uh, fixed matrices that I've pre-computed ahead of time. Um, the cool insight here is if I have that situation where I've pre-computed a lot of the pieces of this problem, but there's some that are still going to change online. Uh, if you if you know a little bit about how matrix uh, factorizations work and how these things get solved numerically, um, it, we're using a QR factorization in a certain spot in here in one of the core places. You can do other things, but generally speaking, how most of them work is they kind of go, uh, at least all the direct serial factorization techniques, they go left to right across the matrix and sort of do a bunch of stuff column wise. So what we did here is we're like, hey, like 80% of these, these big matrices that we're solving in this MPC problem because we've done this ahead of time offline linearization about a reference trajectory, those matrices I know ahead of time and they're all fixed and they don't change. So what I can do now is I can take this giant KKT system, the inner inner linear system I'm solving inside the 
trajectory optimizer. I can plug in all the, the matrices that don't change, uh, or I can plug in everything. But then what I do is I permute the matrix. So I permute, permute uh, rows and columns so that I smush all the pre-computed stuff that I know ahead of time to the left and all the stuff that's going to change online to the right. Now what I can do is I can go do a partial factorization. So I start running the factorization that I would run to solve AX equals B. I can do it offline though, and I can do it column wise across all the stuff that I know ahead of time. I can pre-factorize all that stuff so that online, I only have to factorize the last few columns that are changing online. And it turns out the upshot of this, we did this. The upshot is that if you do this in this particular case, we got a 15 X speed up in the overall MPC solver by basically pre-factorizing a ton of the matrix. So we only have to do a, a little piece and then do a back solve and it, a huge win, which is kind of cool. Um, and honestly, that's one of the things that makes this fast enough to, to do in real time. So this was, I don't know, I threw it in there because it's an interesting little nugget that, that showed up that was a big, big win. Um, okay, so here's some examples of this. This is a cartoony one. So this is an in, inverted pendulum with a little like pusher arm at the top. We call this push bot. Um, and the idea is it's getting, so we linearize the inverted pendulum about the upright equilibrium. That's it, right? We don't put any information in here about contact uh, schedules, modes, nothing. It just has the physics. It knows, you know, the sine distance function. So it knows it can reach out to the walls and it's got linearized dynamics. And then what we do is go kind of perturb it. We punch it uh, with these things and, and this thing's got a balance. So I, I, this little pusher at the top, the other thing to mention is this has mass, right? The little yellow pusher ball. So it can use that to balance, but when it gets hit really hard, it's got to go reach out and hit the wall and to, to avoid falling over. And again, nothing's um, then you know, sort of pre-specified about modes or anything. It's just that optimization problem. And it uh, clearly is reasoning about new contact modes online as it gets perturbed and whatever kind of fun. Um, some more fun things. Um, this is a 2D quadruped. And this is kind of trying to show this reasoning about modes. Um, what we did here was give it a ton of random initial conditions, like in the air falling all over the place, whatever. And we're trying to track a reference uh, gate motion. And you can see this is just that controller running a bunch of Monte Carlo samples, right? But you can see all these random initial conditions. Um, it's doing all kinds of different contact things in the beginning here when it's trying to touch down, right? Clearly there's different mode stuff happening, different contact touchdown timing. The controller is doing all that sort of emergent, whatever. But then you can see it all converges to the nice steady state periodic gate that we put in as the reference to track towards the end of this, right? So that's kind of cool. <clears throat> so that's a bunch of random initial conditions. Model mismatch just for fun. Um, so this is like, you know, putting a big weight on it that wasn't modeled. Um, here we have a little biped that was, it's, it's tracking a reference that was designed for flat terrain, uh, but it's walking on, you know, some varying terrain. That's all fine. Eh. Um, okay, so here's some, here's fun stuff. This is a 3D simplified quadruped model with a really, really big disturbance. So we basically like just absolutely slam the robot such that it's like flying through the air and flailing around. And it's trying to, the reference we're giving it in the MPC controller is this, a trot in place. So we're, we're linearizing everything about trotting in place over there on the left. We absolutely slam it through the air. It's flailing around, feet are, you know, flailing around all over the place. Um, it lands on the ground and then trots its way back to that equilibrium pose that we sort of linearized about. So this, I guess, two things here. One is that it's, it's clearly reasoning about contact modes um, in a pretty sophisticated way and trying to do push recovery and balance and put its feet in new places. Um, and also uh, the linearizations that we're doing where we say linearize the robot dynamics about that reference trot in place motion um, is not hurting us too much, right? Like I would argue this is this is insanely huge disturbance and it's getting pushed way off that nice little equilibrium trot thing, right? It's flinging through the air, all this other stuff. Yet the, the linearizations we're doing are actually holding up and it's it's not face planting or blowing up. It's actually doing, I would I would argue this is really like I was amazed this worked. I guess that's why I'm excited about this, given what we did as far as linearizing about that little reference thing standing in place. It it does this, which is cool. Okay, so that's all the sim stuff. Um the next stuff I'm gonna show you is all extremely, extremely fresh and uh sort of uh not not super dialed in yet. So we, we've been working on getting this stuff onto hardware. Um, this is one of our little Unitree robots. This is it just trotting. Um, it does not look as good as, you know, the Cheetah stuff or really any of the um, hybrid-based MPC schemes at this point, but 
it does work. It can do you know, disturbance rejection -y stuff. We can kick the robot. Uh, we're still actively working on this and trying to smooth it out and get it to look a lot better. But I'd say this is really not what I would argue. This is not what we should be doing with this. This is just we have this stuff and we we're trying to step out. This is like the first thing that actually worked on hardware. But tracking a you know trotting gate, you can do that with the hybrid MPC stuff, right? So and you can do it frankly a lot better than this right now at least. Um, what we're trying to get towards here is can we. You know, can we do uh, with this? We can reason about you know really contact rich things that are not say periodic gates, right? So we're trying to get into that a little bit more. Um, this is just a kind of you know cartoony example where we're trying to you know step up on a, a block and and maybe utilize different contacts on the body instead of just the feet. It's kind of the direction we're headed with this because we've got this ability to like you know reason about um, collision geometry in a fairly sophisticated way, so we don't need just point feet anymore. Um, so that's kind of where we're headed with this. We're still really pushing on the hardware side, trying to get the stuff to work. Um, and with that, uh, I'm going to just tease at the very end here a couple other things. This whole composable optimization thing, I've really focused on this, you know, contact rich, you know, motion plan control and robots stuff here. But it's, it's a much broader story and um, encompasses a lot of other things. In particular, some other things we've worked on. One is game theory. Um, so it turns out that composable thing is actually it generalizes both Nash and Stackelberg equilibria from game theory. So we've done a little bit of work on autonomous driving, modeling like the, the driver interactions with a Nash equilibrium and solving it this way. And it also encompasses similarly a lot of ideas from robust control, like minimax optimization and things like this also very naturally fit this composable optimization paradigm. So it's a pretty general idea. Uh, and then with that, I wanna uh, give a shout out to all my um, PhD and master students who did this work. Um, Simon and Taylor were the main drivers behind a lot of this. Uh, Dojo was them, uh, and a lot of just the contact stuff in general. Um, Brian Jackson, who just graduated a couple of weeks ago, um, was kind of our numerical solver guru who develops a lot of our uh, numerical optimization code. Kevin Tracy uh, has been doing this collision stuff um, that I showed that's um, uh, actually really new. We just submitted that to ICRA, actually. Um, Schwo's kind of our state estimation guru who's uh, done a lot of work on uh, getting the robots to work in the lab and then Chien, who also just graduated uh, this summer or August with his master's degree and is out there in the world now um, he he really got the hardware to work I would say and with that um, I will attempt to answer questions and thank you guys for listening and feel free to bug me and that's how you can get a hold of me um, so yeah I guess if anyone wants to speak up that'd be great uh, I can try going through the chat questions too. Um, so there's one here about like the the tolerances on the row uh, in that interior point stuff. So yeah, we we played with this a bunch, and um, honestly, um, so if you're doing this offline, you can do whatever you want. Um, the reason we play with it a lot, uh, or have played with it a lot, is trying to get things to go fast. So you can imagine like the more you crank that thing, like the more solver iterations you need. And that makes it slower. So when we do the MPC stuff, we actually run it with like pretty coarse tolerances. We kind of keep it at like one e minus three and don't don't crank it at all. And it turns all that MPC stuff is basically doing that. Um, and that's how we a keep the matrices from changing more and do some of that prefactorization stuff. And b it's just faster. It takes fewer iterations to solve that way. And the level of smoothing that's introducing again, if you think about it, you know, in terms of like you know, contact manifold in meters or something like this, millimeter level. So it's really small and physically speaking, and it's it's not enough to you know break the controller. So that's um that's what we've done. And yeah, it definitely it definitely impacts a bunch of things. Um the other thing to mention there is there is a ton of theory from like the optimization literature on how to do that well, how to crank it the best way and stuff like this. Uh robust control work, yeah, some of that is published. We have a paper called direct policy optimization. So if you go to the lab website uh, there and click publications, you can find all this stuff. Um, let's see. There's a question about perception, um, scene analysis and computer vision. So um, no, I guess, is the uh, honest answer there. Oh, that's Chris. Yeah, Chris, we should talk. Uh, come, uh, let, let's, let's, let, I'll, I'll find you this afternoon if you're going to be at the seminar and we should talk about this. Um, I've actually been talking to Diva Ramanan about doing some some things where we hook this together with some of their uh, vision stuff to try to do like physics informed um, reconstruction kind of thing. So we are thinking about collaborating with Diva and I guess uh, some of this stuff, but um, it would be cool to talk more for sure if you have ideas. 
Um, okay, what is the importance of making your own interior point method for this kind of stuff? Uh, it's absolutely crucial. Uh, so this, all of this stuff rests on a foundation of like really dialed in custom optimization methods. Um, that's the secret sauce to doing any of this. You really can't do this. This, this like, I, this composable optimization idea where we're like hooking these problems together requires like really, really deep under the hood integration of different solvers, right? So we have like a second order cone solver for the friction stuff. We have this weird, you know, conic solver for the collision stuff. These are all different optimization problems where we've written custom solvers that are well suited to those particular problems. And then we glue them together in some really sort of deeply integrated ways where we have to, for instance, one example of this is we're actually, when we solve that thing together, um, we're actually cranking on the row parameters in a synchronized way between all those blocks to get them to converge together because that's the only way it works. So there's actually a lot of details in making all that stuff work at the numerical on the numerical side. You absolutely can't do it with like any kind of off the shelf solver because of that like tight level of integration that's required to do it, and and because we need to differentiate through all of it. So we're we're essentially differentiating through the through the solver's uh, solution map is, is a way to think about it. We're diffing the KKT system that the the solver uses internally. So I guess all of that is to say, yeah, you you need to write your own custom stuff, or at least there's no existing off-the-shelf stuff that, that can do this kind of thing, um, which is why we wrote it. Uh, let's see. Um, okay, so there's a question about like good good things to check out to, to get into this kind of thing uh, in general um, from a student. Uh, I guess as a, as a shameless self-plug, uh, my uh, CMU Optimal Control course uh, is all on YouTube and GitHub. So uh, if you want to check out my stuff, you can find it on YouTube and uh, all the like, you know, course materials. Uh, and yeah, I guess just ping me if you want other advice on that, I guess. But that's a decent place to start. Um, what I, I like this, but it's really good. I took the class. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, concerning differentiable interior point method, is there any condition for the differentiability of the optimization problem solution? So yeah, there there are. Um, so there's actually a little paper slash note from um, uh, from someone in Stephen Boyd's group at Stanford. That's the, it's on archive. It's called like on the differentiability of convex optimization problems or something like this, and it basically gives the sort of necessary conditions for differentiability of at least convex problems. So that may be worth a look. So yeah, there are some technical conditions you need to sort of make uh, make sure this works out. Um, but I actually, it turns out like uh, this is a hand wavy fuzzy thing to say, but basically using the interior point stuff. And I, okay, so an example of like where this gets weird though is if you think about the collision stuff. I mentioned this whole idea of you know you have different sort of corner case weird edge case things that happen where things are like not super well defined. Um, so if you imagine you have like you know, two objects, if I'm like, you know, if I, if I have a, and I'm trying to solve for the contact point, like closest point, if I have two cubes, say, that are face to face, if I have corner to corner, it's super clear, it's the corner. But if I go face to face, there's like this, if they're exactly face on and aligned, uh, what's the closest point? There's not a unique closest point, right? It's any point on the surface. And you could call this a patch contact or whatever, but from an optimization perspective, you now have like a singular problem instance where there's like a degeneracy where you can't actually uniquely specify that point. Um, so it turns out, yeah, that's a problem in general and um, does weird things. And that's a case where this these differentiability conditions would be violated. Um, but what we do and why we can get around this is it turns out that you can imagine if I just was solving the collision case, that problem's singular and I can't tell you what the, the right point is. But if I go and couple that um, collision problem with the physics simulation problem, and um, the physics problem says, yeah, these are going to slam into each other, and I'm trying to do this least action thing that's, you know, and I'm trying to suck out the most kinetic energy. It turns out by adding the physics and coupling all those things, it actually resolves the non-uniqueness issue. And now the thing is sort of well-behaved again. So there, I guess the answer number one is there are weird corner cases where differentiability things are, are awkward, but um, it turns out uh, and I, I don't, we don't have so much rigorous, you know, kind of material on this yet. It turns out in a lot of the cases, at least the ones we care about in these robotic settings, where those things crop up by actually coupling these problems, 
um, you, you resolve a lot of those issues because you're adding more information to the problem, right? And, and sort of constraining it in other ways. And in particular, where this showed up for us was the collision stuff. And initially we were trying to solve that separately. And there were these edge cases, but when you glue it together with the physics, the physics sort of nicely resolves the, um, the, the ambiguous cases. And uh, the math way of showing that is actually the big KKT system you build. If it's just the collision problem, it's singular. But when you couple it to the other ones and you get a bigger sort of KKT system, that new one that includes the physics blocks is, is non-singular and has a unique solution. So it's kind of cool as an aside. Um, okay. So I, I just want to pause for one second because I know we're about to hit 11. Oh, yeah. So I want to protect everyone from themselves and just do one quick wrap-up note. And then if you have more time, Zach, we can keep going. But I, I want to like, you know, not... Uh, I want to protect everyone. So I just, I put into the the chat um, some links to follow the TC. You can follow us on our uh, website, on Twitter. Um, we have an email list for future events. And I had, uh, I'm just going to steal screen share for one second. I made one little slide just to note that um, we will have uh, more uh, events, uh, January, February, March, and April. We're trying to get, you know, a real seminar series going. We have some awesome speakers uh, coming up and we will try to be doing events at, at ICRA and IROS as well to keep the community going. Um, so we're here, we exist, and we want to make, uh, to bring everyone more together and keep doing really awesome research. So I just wanted to note all of that and then I'll stop talking again and I can totally pass it back to you, Zach, if you have more time and want to answer more questions. Like you said, I should probably leave and go do, you know, my actual work, but if, if anybody wants to chat more, I can hang out for a little bit longer. And um, yeah, feel free to reach out also. Um, all the email and Twitter and whatever things, although I'm not sure Twitter's gonna survive the next week. Yeah. Uh, well, that might not be great. Um, but yeah, thank you guys for doing this. This is great. Um, I really appreciate it. And I, I think you guys are doing awesome stuff. I'm, I'm excited to see where this, uh, this group kind of goes. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, with that, there's a bunch of stuff in here. I can try to go through these um, and, and answer them if, if we want for another 10 minutes or so. But also, if, if anyone wants to just yell at me, that might get my attention. That, that'll help. Um, so yeah, Chris had this comment about often we don't want accurate derivatives, but derivatives that are cor um, correct for the current step size is local averaging of derivatives. Is it, so yeah, I totally agree with this, Chris. Um, what we're doing here is, you know, I, I, I kind of mentioned or teased where solving the physics problem all the way to tight convergence where it's correct and you're getting accurate simulation, but we back off and get a smooth gradient. And that turns out to be crucial for doing RL and, and control and gives you good answers. And I think there's actually a theoretically grounded like justification for this in terms of like quasi-Newton methods, which always use approximate Hessian and Jacobian information, but still get super linear convergence. So I think that's totally an okay thing to do. Um, I think we haven't done this yet, but I think you can ground this in rigorous theory and say, yeah, we're, you know, sort of epsilon approximating all these things, but that's okay. And all these algorithms still will converge. I think there's sort of hints at that in, in here. Um, so composable, how is that different from hierarchical or stacking things? Um, so I, I would say basically what I, the, I just coined this name, I just made up, but like the idea is that it's super general and we can arbitrarily hook these things together. So it, it can be a hierarchy, right? So I, I would argue it subsumes that or generalizes that idea. We can stack things hierarchically, but if you look at the sort of graph structure of what we're doing right now, it's sort of this weird thing where sort of a couple of these things are wired together here and then they are both sitting above this other block and there's another one that's coupled to both of those. So it's it's a much more general uh, idea that, that you can wire these things together in sort of an arbitrary topology. It doesn't have to be just a hierarchical stack. Um, just it, uh, yeah. yeah just a small question on this so that just mean that you simultaneously solve it uh yeah 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 so what we are really doing we wire these things together at a really low level and i mentioned you know already kind of hinted at this we crank the rows sort of in a synchronized way among all the blocks and that's actually key to making it work and how you can get them all to converge so we we actually jointly solve these things like each one way to think about it is they're synced up on a per Newton iteration basis. So we're not like solving each block to convergence separately and then somehow diffing that. And we're actually at each Newton iteration, we basically take a synchronized Newton step on all those blocks together and then take the next, that's the key thing. So they're all like, they're all their individual little solvers, but they're all wired together at a very, very low level of integration where they're all kind of like, you know, clock synced. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, so Curious about this, uh, in the case that like once you do that, won't the dimensionality increase? And if that is the case, 
uh, 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 that is the case how do you do it online then yeah that becomes yeah. Hard. it's hard <laughs> i mean they're big problems and they're they're not easy to solve and i think i tried to hint at some of the tricks we play to get it to go fast enough a big one was that custom matrix factorization trick where we we did a bunch of linearizing right about references and then a bunch of things we could pre-compute offline and in particular we played this fun game where we um, took the kkt systems for these things per permuted them so all the pre-computed terms were on the left and then pre-factorized most of the matrix ahead of time offline and cached that stuff so that online we only had to like finish the last few columns of the factorization and this was a 15x speed up like ridiculous right order more than an order of magnitude speed up so that's like it's really hard i guess is the the punchline is these are big problems they're messy problems to solve um and we're playing lots and lots of tricks and just barely getting them to work in real time right now <laughs> so there's a lot more work to do there um in terms of you know getting to be robust and like work over longer horizons right we're also using really short horizons right now and like making a bunch of simplifying approximations to just get them to run in, in real time so there's yeah tons to be done there um but i guess one one thing i want to mention on that front though is like I would argue that like a necessary condition for doing this stuff in real time, like doing MPC, is having good super linear convergence, local convergence on these things, right? If I can't get super linear convergence on one of these optimization problems, that means like I really can't bound the number of say Newton steps or whatever I need to solve this thing, right? And so one of the big, big sort of differentiators between what, what I just talked about and like the older work on contact implicit optimization that tried to like smooth stuff and whatever, um, because we're using this interior point stuff, there is rigorous theory there. Like um, we get local super linear convergence on these things. So like if you, if you give me like an epsilon perturbation, uh, you know, whatever, and which is what you want for MPC, right? For MPC, I'm pretty close to the reference and I just want to be able to converge in like one or two Newton steps, right? And that's what we've got here. We've got a setup that actually gives us this like super linear near quadratic local convergence. So I can basically solve like one or two of those KKT systems at each iteration and like it works, right? Yeah, exactly. so I'll jump in here. Um, so uh, kind of a philosophical question at the beginning, you were contrasting, you know, the fix the mode sequence versus the contact implicit but with the contact implicit with your deterministic solver, you're kind of implicitly picking a contact sequence based on your initial conditions. And in the sense that whatever you pick, that kind of sets what you're going to ultimately converge to. Um, and in the past, that was a very sensitive, uh, sensitive choice to make in a sense that if you didn't touch the object that you wanted to in the initial guess, then what you were going to converge to wasn't going to touch it either. Whereas in your quadruped example with the big pushes, you're discovering very different contact sequences than, than the initial guess. And so I guess I'm, I'm curious, what do you see as, you know, kind of the fundamental difference with what you're doing that's enabling you to, uh, to do that? Uh, yeah, it's a tough question. Like there is obviously, these are still like non-convex problems, right? They're still like grotesquely hard optimization problems to solve. And so there is always this issue of like local optima and your initial guesses and basins of attraction and stuff. None of that's going away. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I think like, I guess maybe another way of getting at this is to say that like, what we're really doing here is giving you a, so you, you know, I, I'm always, I, I always go back when I, when I think about this stuff, you know, I'm always still inspired by the like now 10 year old work from like, um, Emo Todorov and, uh, and, and, uh, all of these guys, um, that did this like crazy contact invariant thing where these characters were climbing on top of each other and doing crazy gymnastics and stuff like this. Um, and that stuff, you know, is in insanely impressive. And, um, but they, they got at that by using really, really smoothed out contact physics where you had nice gradient information that was sort of informing you of where to make and break contact and stuff like this. And it was cartoony physics, but the, you know, the planning results are in, in super impressive, right? And I think what well, we're kind of, and I, I, so I love that work, but I, what, what I kind of want to do is have something that's able to do that sort of reasoning, but then actually converge towards a true physics, like hard contact answer that I can run on a robot. Um, and so here, I think we, we've kind of got that flavor to some extent where we can start with a very relaxed barrier parameter, that row. And what that really does, it's giving you all kinds of contact um, gradient information, right? So that row, if it's very backed off, you get this nice smooth gradient off the contact manifold that's like, okay, if you want forces, if you need friction and, and 
you know, normal forces to like manipulate something or move yourself through the environment. Hey, look, I have this nice smooth gradient that says if I go closer and closer to the floor or the wall or whatever, I can have more force, right? So at the beginning few iterations, you have this very smoothed out, um, very informative sort of like cost landscape or gradient landscape that gets you that information. And I think that's kind of the key thing. Like we can start it out super, super smoothed out, um, a la those like, you know, those results um, from, from, you know, uh, Emo's group. Um, but then we have a very nice, like rigorous, you know, way of cranking on that smoothing stuff from the optimization world that lets us converge it to the hard answer. And that's backed up by, again, like really nice uh, theoretical properties and fast convergence rates, all that stuff, right? So I think that's kind of the key idea that lets it discover these things. Uh, yeah, hopefully that was useful. Love it, thanks. And with that, I probably do actually need to go. <laughs> but thank you guys, it was really fun. Um, uh, I'm gonna definitely try to come to these over the next few months. Uh, thank you guys so much for organizing. Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming and thanks Zach for, for the awesome talk and answering so many questions uh, after. Um, and we will see all of you virtually soon and then hopefully in person uh, soon too. Awesome. Thanks, guys.